we've been uh, working our way through this uh, message series that called Faith Seeking Understanding. And uh, today I'd like to uh, uh, remind us of some words uh, from the Apostle Paul in Romans 3. Now these are just a handful of words actually, and each one of these verses is actually pretty short, but boy is there a lot of power behind it. The Apostle Paul here is wrote, writing to the church at Rome, and this is a church he'd never visited, so he's giving good, solid the theological advice. And he says this in verse 21. But now apart from the law of God been made known uh, to us through the law and the prophets, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrificial atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did, not do the, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just, and to the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. We're about ready to enter into a time of teaching, so I invite you to turn your attention to the screen. Often as we contemplate God, we are either feeling with our emotions or perhaps thinking with our mind. Always letting scripture prevail. This is faith seeking understanding. So we've been uh, going through this series uh, that I just simply call faith seeking understanding. Now you may wonder what that means. Well, faith seeking understanding is a very, very old definition of theology. That's all that means is when, when asked, what is theology? That means the faith that we have deep in our heart is uh, we're trying to figure it out. We're trying to wrap our human mind around that kind of thing. Uh, I think this was originally uh, uh, coined by uh, St. Augustine, so very, very long ago. The idea that faith seeking understanding. So we have faith and we have a desire to know more. And that, in essence, is what theology is about. Now, a lot of times we think, ah, theology, uh, it's too heady, it's just too much. But really what, th what theology is, is trying to help us wrap our minds around this glorious thing we call the gospel. Does that make sense, everyone? Give me a little nod. Are you with me on this so far? So here we go with uh, faith-seeking understanding. And today we're going to be talking about one of the pivotal points of Christian belief, and that is sacrificial atonement. Yes, I know that's kind of a big $5 word, uh, but what we're talking about here is sacrificial atonement is that there's a sacrifice given for forgiveness. And that is the, uh, that is the ultimate understanding of the gospel. Now, as you'll see, the common thread throughout this whole series is why theology matters. Why are these things important? And hopefully that as we go through this, you understand the importance of all this. Now, last week we started out by talking about living in the fullness of God, and we understand the fullness of, of God to be the Trinity, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together are God. And today we're going to be talking about holiness requires a sacrifice. Now, those two things seem like they're at opposing ends at, at each other. And that's partly what we're going to be talking about today. Those two different perspectives. Okay, first of all, before we get too far into this, we, we need to understand God a little bit more. We need to uh, help to focus in on who God is. And we often think of God as holy and loving. And that seems pretty natural, right? He is holy, absolutely. But one of the things that we don't often think about is in God's holiness, who is perfect, who is righteous, who, ha who is the epitome, this, the, the absolute pinnacle of goodness, right? The one thing that we often forget is that because of my sin, 
I cannot stand in the presence of God's holiness. His holiness would overwhelm me. His holiness is talked about uh, in the New Testament is a consuming fire. It's too much. We would not be able to be in the presence of God. So in other words, in justice, his holiness demands nothing less than perfection from me. And because I am not perfect, because I do not have the same holiness as God, the only thing that can make up for that is death. Isn't that funny to think holiness and the end result of that is death? But God is more than just holy. Yes, God is entirely holy, and sometimes that's bad news for us, except when we remember his love. His love for us is overwhelming. His love for us is, is powerful. And God has found a way to merge those two ideas that in his strict holiness and in his love, he has made a way for us to be with him. And that is the penalty of our sin is death. But he loves us so much, he, pour out, he poured out his grace to make a loophole. And that loophole is someone else's death can pay our price. To be honest, I think that because God made every man, woman, and child on planet Earth from the very beginning, I think that was kind of sewn into us, that idea. And there are certain cultures who have taken that to a disgusting extreme into human sacrifice. That is not at all God's plan. Give me a little nod. Are you with me on that? When we're talking about sacrifice, we are not talking about human sacrifice. God said you can take an animal, just a beast, sacrifice that beast, and then you'll be able to stave off temporarily the ultimate price that would have to be paid. Now, I say that right now, even before I get into my major points, we can kind of set the stage that this sacrificial atonement is all about grace. It's all about love. It is all about God's supernatural desire to have us be saved. That is the key. And when you take a look at the Old Testament, we take a look at the blood sacrifice of the Old Testament law, and we start to understand where this grace started to come from. Even in the Old Testament law, we understand that this is God's love and grace at work. You know, this comes from uh, Leviticus, which is the book of uh, the Levites, which is a book of a lot of law. And here it's spelled out so clearly. The offering is a burnt offering from the herd. You are to make an offering of a male without defect. In other words, as close as possible, uh, not, not an animal you would just waste, but a very valuable one. You must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so it will be acceptable to the Lord. He even gives us instructions, and these instructions are interesting. You are to lay your hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it will be accepted on your behalf. Did you catch that? The animal will be accepted on your behalf to make atonement for you. In other words, God said, I know, I know, I know you cannot be as good as I am. You cannot be as holy as I am. But in justice, there must be death. So this death will push off your death. Keep pushing it off, staving off judgment. Now, in the Old Testament, I've got to tell you, this seems kind of harsh, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like, oh my goodness. This does not sound very loving, let alone gracious. But from the perspective of God, it was a loving act. Now, we are not people necessarily of the Old Testament. We are also people of the New Covenant. 
And now we need to take a look at what the gospel has to do with all this. We need to understand that Jesus' blood was a perfect grace, was perfect grace. And the only reason that we can say that is that the, 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 the law hasn't changed. God didn't change the rules. Remember, he is perfect, and we are not perfect. These uh, uh, Old Testament offerings that were continually made well, were, were not enough to even forgive one person's sin for more than a moment. Because these are just beasts. They're just animals. It's not good enough. And we already said human sacrifice is not where it's at, right? But God, on the other hand, Remember, we talked about last week that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together are God. And God sent the very Son, the Son of God, to take on human form. And in that way, the sacrifice was perfect. The sacrifice was as holy as God is because the Son of God is nothing less than God. Yet, he took on human form so he could bleed and die for us. Now, as we take a, a closer look at uh, Romans 3, the righteousness is given through faith uh, in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now, isn't that cool? We have a tendency to run through some of these and just kind of say, okay, it's, righteousness is given. No, righteousness, the very righteousness of God The holiness and the righteousness of God has been given to those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. And not just uh, a few of us here, but to all who believe. Now we can't even minimize all. Remember, he's writing this to Gentile people like us. What he's saying is so powerful. What Jesus did was perfect enough to eradicate the sin and bring righteousness to every single man, woman on earth who is walking the earth today and whoever walked the earth in the past and whoever is to come. Because remember, he's nothing less than God. Isn't it funny how he is, Paul is giving this to people who never even heard of the law because his righteousness is so glorious. He even emphasizes there, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sometimes whenever I see the word all, I like to replace my name into it. For Phil has, fall, has uh, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Anyone testify that's you too, right? That's right. Because we have fallen short of the glory of God, he is made a way, and all are justified freely by his grace. And he goes on to say, through this redemption that came through Christ Jesus, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Can you see it's still the Old Testament law? brought to a glorious conclusion. Christ was a sacrifice of atonement. There's one more word I want to throw into this. It is called substitutionary atonement. You don't need to write this down. There will not be a test. But the idea of substitutionary atonement means I deserve the death but Jesus substituted himself for me. I got to tell you, when I've been working on this all week, when I got to this point, I always just got shivers of like, oh God, this is, this is too much, too much to ask. And even this morning as I was going through it, I thought, okay, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good, I'm pretty good. And man, I was wiping tears away. Jesus said, I will die for you. The God of all the universe said, 
I am all holy. The penalty is death. But in his grace, he said, I found a way to substitute your sin for another person's death. Yes, it started out with animals, just critters, but it ended up being me. God said, I will sacrifice myself for you. Before I let this go, how many times have you seen movies where the hero sacrifices himself for a loved one or a brother in arms or, or maybe even for the whole world and in some sort of you know, uh, a superhero kind of movies? You see that kind of thing and you think, oh, wow, that's so cool. This person's self-sacrifice was so vital. And you just don't see that. Paul said, a good man may dare to die for someone else, but it just doesn't happen. I was watching one of those movies um, a couple of days ago, and honestly, I am not someone who is moved to tears by movies, okay? That's just not, it's just not the way I'm wired. But I've been thinking about this all week, the whole idea of someone dying on my behalf all week. And I saw that. And for no reason, I'm just bawling. And it's not because the acting was great or the writing was perfect. It, be, it was because it was a reminder, a real reminder, that a real person, and that by the name of Jesus, who is nothing less than God, died for me. I wouldn't expect anyone in this room to die for me. I wouldn't expect anyone in this world to die for me. But the God of the universe did. And I got to tell you, that shook me. Just shook me to the core. But what really shakes me intellectually, okay, moving from the heart to the head, is these next couple of words. To be received by faith. To think that God did all that for me and to make that work in my life, all I need to do is receive it by faith. Another translation I like a lot says, made effective through faith. God did all this. And if you want that in your life, you can. You don't even need to pay for it. You don't even need to beg for it. All we need to do is receive that into our lives. And atonement is made. Sacrifice has been exchanged. And we can live forever. I know that's a bunch of theology. But you know something? That is what theology is about. But I can't leave it there. We need to understand what the consequences are in our lives. Yes, we know we have a God who is all holy, yet all loving. Yes, we understand about sacrificial atonement, one blood for another. We also know about substitutionary atonement, the idea that someone took our place instead of us. But at the end of the day, we need to know what that means in our own lives, that we must live the new life in Jesus. How can you not live that new life? You opened up your heart, you received it by faith, it's made effective in your life. And now what? We need to understand what it is to live that life in him. I want to remind you, what, again, this is the Apostle Paul, this time writing to the Corinthians. He says, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. In other words, how dare we look at the rest of the world the way the world looks at other people? How dare we say, uh, this person is short, this person is tall, this person is beautiful, and this person is homely. All those kinds of things are absolutely repugnant in the eyes of God. 
How dare we even say this person is a sinner and this person is holy? Outside of God, it makes no difference. So he says, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do no longer. When we look at the world, we have new lenses. Paul describes it like this, as a new creation. He says, therefore, uh, if, Christ, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone, no matter who you are around the world or what your past is, where your present is, if anyone uh, is in Christ, the new creation has come. The new creation has come. And he is ready to lay his hand on you and make a change in your life. He goes on to say it like this. The old is gone. The new is here. And all this is from God. He's ready to change your life into something better. Remember we said how good and holy God is and we are not? Every step of the way he's going to make us more and more in his image. And the only way that was even possible is who reconciled himself to us through Christ. Because of what Christ did, he substituted himself for us. We can be more and more like Christ. After all, he gave us this ministry of reconciliation. And this ministry of reconciliation says we are to be in the world to reconcile God to his people so they can receive it with faith, make it effective in their lives, not only to live forever, and to be in the glories of heaven for all of eternity, but to do the same here on earth. Wow. That's a lot of love, isn't it? It's a lot of grace. And all this comes from a holy God who loves you so much. He took your place. He took your place so we can be with him forever. And to live that new life in Christ while we're still here. So let me ask you, do you feel like you're living, you don't need to raise your hand on this. I'm not here to embarrass anybody, but I want you to think. Are you living that new life? Do you know that new life gurgling up inside of you so you can barely contain it? If the answer is yes, hallelujah. Shout it from the mountaintops. If not, maybe it's because you didn't understand the connection between salvation and what it is to live in his new life here, even now. In just a few minutes, we're all going to pray together, okay? And as always, I don't expect you um, to necessarily listen to what I have to say. I, I want you to spend time with your Lord and Savior. But if all of this is slightly new to you, and you're not even sure whether or not you've received that by faith, today would be a great day to say, Lord, I want that. And if you're really not sure about that new life gurgling up inside of you, maybe today is a day you want to say, I want to live that. As we pray together, all I ask is you turn your heart to Christ. Listen to that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit nudging you forward, always forward. Let's pray together, shall we? Precious Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you 
Oh, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that although you are all holy, you have made a way for us to be with you forever. You have made a way, oh Lord, for us to live a life in you even now. Lord, I know there may be people here today who just simply need to receive that love and grace to take that sacrificial atonement and make it effective in their lives by faith. So, Lord, I pray those people would say, Lord, I want to receive your love and grace. And for those who are, uh, want to have that new life in Christ brimming up inside them, I would pray that they would be opening up their hearts to say, Lord, I want more. I want more of you. I want more of you. I want less of me. I want less of the world and more of you so I can be a shining example wherever I go. Oh, precious Lord Jesus, I just pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would do an amazing work in this church, in the lives that are here, in those who are watching around the world. Lord, I would pray that your hand may rest upon us now and forever. For all this is in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, let's stand and sing.